All right, so another wonderful morning here in the world, and I'm with Dr. Mike Van Thielen, who is once again joining us here uh, on our channel. I'm super excited to have you back. Dr. Mike, how are you doing there today, sir? I'm doing great. Saturday morning, excited to be on your show. Let's do it. Let's do it. So um, uh, the last uh, call we did, uh, we talked about the uh, EMR, the hidden threat, and um, <clears throat> Uh, today we're going to go through uh, the uh, the other book here, which uh, I have it right well right here. Look at that! Look at that! You were oh prepared, John. No, oh, that's that's, that's the EMR book. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Optimize your immune system, and um, we were talking before the call, <clears throat> and there's a lot of information that's in this book uh, that you published that does. Um, sort of correlate with some of the stuff we talked about before. So it's kind of good to just go back over some of that stuff. And before we get into the questions and answers, I do want to just go briefly over uh, your credentials, which are fantastic. And you are a published author of seven books. So um, we, we're covering the second one now. But um, PhD, Holistic Nutrition, Doctor of Oriental Medicine, licensed physical therapist, licensed acupuncture physician, bachelor's in professional health studies, bachelor's in physical education, entrepreneur, philanthropist, um, international keynote speaker, renowned author, and world record holder in swimming. And um, uh, as a keynote speaker, I have been to your presentations. They're fantastic. So, um, you know, that you. is a... Uh, uh, a great uh, opportunity for anybody that's out there that's looking for keynote speakers. So um, with the immune uh, system in the book, uh, you mentioned that drugs don't cure. Uh, and, and that's an interesting statement to make. And I'm interested to hear um, what is your explanation on uh, drugs and why they don't cure and basically what their function is? Well, first of all, Sean, let's look at what drugs really are in a simplistic way, right? So they're basically fake synthetic copies of active compounds found in mother nature. Because as we all know by now, it's not a secret. Uh, the big farmers are there out to make money. And in order to make money, you need a patent. And you cannot patent something out of mother nature. So we cannot just sell plants or sell herbs and make billions of dollars. So what happens is, is once we identify a certain herb, plant, food, or whatever it may be from mother nature, what the big pharma or the scientists are going to do, they're going to, you know, study that plant or herb or food. Uh, and they're going to try to identify the active ingredient that causes a certain effect or has a certain healing property. Once they identify that active ingredient or certain active compound, they're going to isolate it and try to make a synthetic copy in the laboratory. And that's what a drug really is. The problem with that is we encounter many adverse reactions because we isolated something. The plant has another thousands and thousands of essential nutrients and active compounds that work in synergy. Now, not all plants are healthy either. We know there's toxic plants of that out there, but usually the plant has the antidote to the toxicity also. So when we isolate things, we get into problems and we don't get the absorption because something in mother nature, our body recognizes and absorbs something that's a synthetic copy, our body usually cannot absorb or break down. So, so that's the first part for people to realize what drugs really are. We always can find a better alternative in mother nature because the drug is a copy anyways. That's number one. Number two, once we look at that pill, Sean, what we can see is that it is dead matter. There's no living aspect to it. You know, um, when we eat plants or wholesome foods, you know, plants are alive. We have uh, life ingredients. When we look at a pill, it's 100% dead matter. And something people need to realize is that dead matter cannot act. It cannot do anything. It only can be acted upon, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, dead matter cannot act. So it certainly can't cure. So when people take drugs, the drugs are not doing anything. It's the body that reacts to the ingestion of the drug. Mm. And that's why many times we see similar uh, adverse reactions from the drugs. We always see nausea, vomiting, lightheadedness, dizziness, 
rashes, those types of things. And if we look at those actions of the body, those are all actions to try and purge, expel the toxins. That's what those actions really are. The body doesn't recognize it, it's toxic and wants to purge it, wants to get rid of it through the skin via a rash, you know, nausea, vomiting, let's get it out of here, right? So the body only acts upon those types of things. Um, many times also, another good statement is that many times drugs do exactly the opposite of what we wanted to do in the long term. We all heard the fact that drugs just put a Band-Aid on, and that's so, so true. A good example always is when they prescribe people diuretics. I see many, many patients, they got the swollen lower legs or ankles, the doctor prescribes diuretics. It's the opposite of what we should do because why is the body holding on to water? Because it doesn't get enough water. So it's holding on to it, right? So when we use a diuretic, we're gonna get rid of that water. When we stop the diuretic, the swelling comes back because the body's trying to hold on to it. The solution is actually quite the opposite. We need to drink more water so the body doesn't have to hold on to it. And so drugs always have the short-term effect uh, but never any last, lasting effect. So when I say drugs don't cure, I just don't mean drugs really. I mean, drugs don't cure, surgeries don't cure, food doesn't cure, supplements don't cure, therapies don't cure. Only the body can heal itself. We need to start realizing that we as humans, we should not intervene with the body because as you said, Sean, last time we talked about those trillions of cells and each of them performing millions of chemical reactions per second. And the fact that we think that we can understand that and we can intervene, you know, it's basically laughable. The only thing we need to understand is that the body knows what it's doing. And so our job is, is to put the body in the correct or in the right condition so that it can heal itself. That's really, uh, there's a lot of information in what you just said. And, you know, I do talk to a lot of people that have that issue with the swelling of the legs and holding on to that water. And um, that, that, that statement about the body's holding on because the body's not getting enough water is really eye-opening. Very eye-opening. Um, I do want to follow up with maybe some stuff about that. Um, and so... Before I go into my next question, because you do compare uh, humans to animals as well, but can you just can you just maybe say maybe what are the top three things that you would want to do to get into the body, or what are the top three things you would suggest to sort of counteract that, or what are the top three things you think the body really needs to maintain good, you know, good general health and wellness. Oh, in general, well, that's hard to say. Of course, we, okay. we, need, we need water, we need hydration. Uh, later on, we'll talk about the immune system and the lymphatic system. And mm -hmm. so we will talk about the importance of hydration there because our system is a plumbing system. We got our cardiovascular system, we got our lymphatic system that carries the white blood cells. And so, you know, number one, hydration. Number two, movement. You know, okay. those systems all will clog up if we don't move. That doesn't mean we need to go to the gym or play organized sports, but we need to move. So I would say, you know, uh, movement, enough water, and then enough sleep. Because when we talk about sleep, we know that our body needs to repair, replenish, and regenerate. Those are very three basic things besides, obviously, a healthy diet that need to be in place as a basis for optimal health. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you for that. No worries. So you often compare um, humans to animals. You compare us to animals in the wild. And uh, that's kind of an interesting statement. But um, wh why, why, why do you say that? And, and what is the message that you're trying to get across to people? Yeah, I came up with that a while ago when, when I kind of started to get frustrated, right? Because I have a, a conventional medicine background with physical education, physical therapy, and then I started to go into more what they call the alternative or natural medicine. And when I started to applying those therapies like acupuncture, herbal medicine, homeopathy, I saw that they were less harmful and less invasive solutions to certain problems, but I didn't see the lasting results either. So I really felt frustrated and I had to go back to basics. And so that's when I, number one, um, you know, went, uh, 
to get my PhD in holistic nutrition because I had to go back to basics. But simultaneously, I looked at uh, animals in the wild and mother nature to really find the truths about health. And I think I find the truths about health and they're, they're actually pretty simple. And so when I find the truths about health, in my own research and trying to get there, I really looked at animals in the wild. And that's why I keep on bringing them up because if we look at their behaviors and look at what they do, we can really find the truths about what we should and should not be doing, mm -hmm. right? So, so let's explain the difference between us humans and animals in the wild. And there's only really one difference and it's what I call awareness. Mm -hmm. See, animals in the wild, they have an instinct and they act according to the laws of mother nature to preserve their own life and to preserve their species. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, that's what they do. They don't have the freedom to choose their response. They act according to the laws of mother nature. And that's why they are in perfect health, mm -hmm. right? Have you ever seen a lion, a giraffe, a rhino, an eagle, an antelope with COPD, with Alzheimer's, with a heart attack, Right. Uh, with psoriasis, um, with with COVID or with the flu. Have you ever seen a fat one? No, we have not because they are in perfect health because they act according to the laws of mother nature, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's some good examples there. Number one, animals in the wild only eat once a day. Uh, we eat multiple times a day. Our digestive system is only designed to eat once a day. Mm -hmm. So when people in the gym and when when health gurus start taking, oh, we need to eat five times a day or three times a day or constantly snacking, you know, I'll look at Mother Nature and say, no, that's not true. You're probably trying to sell a diet or a supplement. But if we look at our biology and physiology and we look at Mother Nature, we're only supposed to eat once a day, just like the Greeks and the Romans did also, just like mm -hmm. Moses did. They only ate once a day. Mm -hmm. um, they also don't combine food, right? When you look at birds, they may eat seeds. Next day, some of them may eat a worm, but they're not going to get a worm. They're going to get seeds and they mix it up and then consume it. So we need to look at food combining. Um, when a lion in the in the Sahara, you know, in Africa, when they when they hunt, it's usually early in the morning or at night. And then when they eat their prey, they go rest. They go in the shade. They hide from the heat. And they let digestive that let their digestive system do the work. They're not going to run around or walk around. So when we look at all those little things, we know exactly what we should be doing. When a mother gives birth to a young, they eat the placenta. It's, it's mother nature is an instinct. Why do they do that? Is because as we know, the placenta has all these stem cells, the young stem cells that will repair the damage that is done of giving birth to the organs of the mother, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when we look at stem cells, we know that they are important for renewing and regenerating and repairing damaged or damaged tissue in our body. So there's so many ways that we can look at mother nature and find the solution of the things that we should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. Now we, on the other hand, we don't have an instinct. We have that awareness. We have the freedom to choose our response. And we have frankly become slaves of choosing the wrong response over and over and over again. And that has put us, at least the majority of us, 98% in what we call ill health, right? Now, fortunately or luckily, we have the same power, the same awareness to stop this nonsense once and forever and, you know, regain control of that health because we have that awareness. We have the freedom to choose our response. So it's time for us to choose that awareness and choose that freedom and make the right choices, put our body in the right condition so that it can heal itself and regain, maintain, and sustain optimal health. That's that's really, really good information. And you're absolutely right. You never see animals in the wild run around with um, the, the myriad of different things that humans are, are dealing with. Um, just real quick, what... Um, the other, the other thing that I've that I've talked about, and uh, I'd like to get your feedback on that also, is the um, is the earthing grounding. Um, you know, animals are grounded and basically in connection with the with the earth seven twenty four, and um, you know, humans obviously are not, and um, you know, that's that's another thing that they've got within their environment that we've also got that we don't really take advantage of because I don't think we really understand how important that is. No, and that's 100% correct. I'm glad you mentioned it. We wear clothes, we wear shoes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even clothes, the, the animals don't wear clothes. It's also the sunlight, not the heat, but it's the sunlight 
that causes the activation of our physiological processes in the body, not just the vitamin D that we always talk about, but every physiological process is stimulated by sunlight. And then, like you said, there's no shoes they're in contact with the earth, which is grounding. So the earth constantly feeds negative ions to neutralize free radicals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, you know, that's a great point. And on top of that, they don't eat man-made foods. They ate organic, wholesome fruits and foods and plants from mother nature. So it's all alkaline. That's why they don't get any disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are really, really good statements and it's eye opening. And the thing about it, like you say, this is all things that if we're aware of it, that we can start making changes within our lives to get more on that natural path and get away from a lot of the things that are really, you know, causing a lot of detriment to our health. Um, so in, in the in the book, you made the statement that um, uh, uh, with our immune system, um, does it, what is, what is it compromise of? What, what does our immune system sort of, what, what is that system and what is it? Yeah, our immune system really is a network of cells and proteins that protect our body from foreign uh, substances or invaders, viruses, bacteria, which we kind of call antigens. And it does that by producing an immune response, right? So when, when people say immune system, there's really not an organ or one specific thing in our body that, that gives us that immune response. So it's a network or a system, but there's basically six major components uh, to that system. Number one is our lymphatic system. Our lymphatic system, again, is like a plumbing system. But what people may not know is our lymphatic system contains, or the fluid contains, our white blood cells. So mm -hmm. it basically brings our white blood cells or transports them all over our body, wherever they're needed to do what? To fight an infection. Without that system, the white blood cells cannot get there. So that's number one. Number two, our lymphocytes, which are basically our white blood cells, right? Uh, that we all know fight infection. So the white blood cells, uh, they are generated by the bone marrow. Now, when they stay at the bone marrow level and they mature, they become B cells. When they move to the thymus, they actually become T cells. And we all heard about B cells and T cells because B cells is kind of our, if we look at the army, it would be our intelligence system. It's going to kind of locate the pathogen or the antigen, and then it's going to send defenses to tag it. And then our T cells are the soldiers that go there and kill it or neutralize it, right? So we need those B cells and T cells. So that's number two, our lymphocytes, B cells, T cells. Uh, the third part of our uh, immune system is our respiratory system, which is, of course, our mouth, our larynx, pharynx, our trachea, bronchi, our lungs, right? And they keep many pathogens out because... You know, yes, we have the tonsils, but our whole uh, trachea, our mouth, our larynx has a mucous membrane. And the mucus, the mucus uh, actually is there to capture and get these pathogens, get these invaders before they get into the lungs and get into our system. And then we have very small muscles uh, called cilia, which are as thin as hair. And those cilia muscles move that mucus up and down to trap those pathogens. And that's why smoking is so bad because it burns those uh, little, uh, it dries up the mucus and it burns those little muscles. And so it cannot functions as a barrier against pathogens anymore. So our respiratory system is very important uh, to try to trap them and kill them before they get into our lungs. So that's number three. Number four is our spleen. Our spleen itself, um, partakes in the immune response, but it's also the storage place of our white blood cells. Number five, our skin. We all know our skin is our largest organ. It's obviously the barrier between our internal and external environment, but most people don't realize that our, our skin contains 20 billion T cells, soldiers that are standing on the wall to evade of those pathogens and antigens, right? Skin is very important. And then last but not least is our gut. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, health promoters out there that really, really focus on gut health, you know, saying that if our health, uh, our gut's healthy, we're in perfect health and they're really honing on it. And the reason why they do that is because our gut 
is shown to be at least 60% responsible for our immunity, our immune response. So the gut's very important. The gut is our microbiome. We got our healthy bacteria there to counteract the unhealthy bacteria. And the gut really activates our immune response and fights inflammation. So now we see that, you know, the immune system comprises of those six major components. And in order to have a healthy immune system that works very well, keeps us healthy, doesn't get us sick, we need to make sure that those six components are working synergistically and they all are uh, function um, in an optimal condition. Wow. That's, that's, you know, we keep talking about, um, you know, I, I keep going back to our, our first call. Actually, the when I saw the presentation uh, at the uh, event in Orlando, um, 150 to 100 trillion cells, each one of those cells is doing about 100,000 functions per second. A few million, actually. A few million per, per second. second. And, I, yes. and I love the fact you started off with that because it is laughable to think that we could really ever truly understand how, how amazing that actually is. And what you just said about the, um, the immune system working on so many different levels and so many different parts of the body in itself uh, is just absolutely amazing. I mean, it really is absolutely amazing. Um, in the book, uh, Health for Life, um, you also um, uh, claim or you say that there is uh, there's only there's no disease there's only symptoms um, that was also a very interesting statement can you kind of clarify um, the your thoughts on that yeah uh, the best way probably to illustrate it is with a few examples mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> a good one is always to understand is you know somebody ends up in their you know 20s or 30s or even 40s with uh, acid reflux right? So it becomes bothersome. Uh, it becomes painful. And we go to the doctor. And what is the doctor going to do? They're going to prescribe us that purple pill, Nexium, right? Mm -hmm. To, to kind of counteract the acidity and not have the symptoms. Now, what we're doing really here is hiding the symptoms, uh, but we're not asking, and the doctor certainly not asking, why is there an indigestion? Why is the acid coming up into our throat? What's causing it? Nobody asked that. But the, the answer is pretty simple. We are combining certain foods. And uh, in, in the long run, the body cannot compensate for that anymore. And it's going to send things back up, right? And when I say combining foods, again, we can go back to the animals we talked about because animals don't combine foods. But even from a pure biological, physiological point of view, here's the explanation. If we eat proteins, <coughs> our stomach acidity needs to be at a certain pH in order to break those down. And those proteins need a very specific enzyme to break, and down, break them down. And that enzyme is called pepsin. Now, let's say we eat carbohydrates. Carbohydrates need a different acidity, a different pH in our body to break down. It also needs a different enzyme called amylase to digest those carbohydrates. Now, let's say we combine the proteins and the carbohydrates like a, a meatball sandwich. The sandwich is the carbohydrates, the meatball is the proteins, right? Or any other type of sandwich or spaghetti with meatballs, or we eat a steak with mashed potatoes or a baked potato, you name it. We combine those both, we eat them at the same time. The body doesn't know what to do. We are, what acidity are we using? What, um, what enzymes are we excreting? So the body needs to make a choice. So it's going to say, okay, we're going to break down the um, proteins first. So we need pepsin and we need a certain acidity. So now the carbohydrates are going to sit there for six, at least six hours waiting for the proteins to be digested. During that time, those carbohydrates will ferment. They will rot. They will excrete. They will become toxic. There will be toxins. There will be no benefit. And so the body constantly compensates for that. But at a certain point, it's going to say, I can't do it anymore. And there is our first symptom of indigestion, in this case, acid reflux. What we're doing is we're not telling the patient like, hey, you know, we got to stop combining these certain foods because your digestive system can't handle anymore. Because, Sean, it would go away in one week. You will not have those symptoms anymore. But we take this pill Nexium. And what happens is this, okay, you know, we're dealing with this acid reflux and it may be working. But meanwhile, we continue to um, 
accelerates the symptoms. We continue to evolve because we're not taking the cause away. And X years later, we end up with a stomach ulcer, okay? Meaning the problem got worse. We go to the doctor. Again, the doctor's not going to say, look, it's time that we change your diet or the way we do things or let's try to figure out what's causing it. No, we're just going to remove that ulcer. Problem solved, band-aid done, but we didn't change our habits. So another decade later, we end up with stomach cancer and hopefully we'll survive it. So what we're doing here is we have a simple symptom that could have an easy solution that could have been resolved in a week and never would have returned. But instead, we're putting on a Band-Aid. The, the, the symptoms continue to get worse and worse and worse and we'll end up with cancer decades later, which all easily could have been prevented if the doctor knew what he was talking about or was interested in finding out the cause of this symptom. <clears throat> So <clears throat> when we do an autopsy, <clears throat> we could say, oh, this person died of cancer. Well, really not. Cancer was the last symptom. What the person really died of was years and years of you know, unhealthy lifestyle habits. In this case, combining the wrong foods. We can say after an autopsy, this person died of a heart attack. Well, that was the last symptom. Mm -hmm. But did they really die of a heart attack? No, they died off eating a large cheese pizza for the last three decades, you know, clogging up their arteries, their triglycerides went to the three, four hundreds, you know. So again, the cause really was not a heart attack. There was the last symptom, okay? So to me, there is no disease, there's symptoms, and we can stop and reverse those. Uh, and if we don't, they just get worse and worse and worse, okay? So that's why I say that the last time we talked about toxemia too, Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's other types of symptoms. We have acute symptoms like a fever, for example. Now, a fever is not a disease. A fever is a response of our immune system, which we're talking about, to kill a pathogen. Okay. And so we need to let that happen. We should not counteract that with drugs to reduce that fever because we're fighting against our own body. And when we talk about degenerative disease and cancer, we have to go back to toxemia. So people can watch our last interview about toxemia, because if they understand the concept of toxemia, we know on how we can prevent cancer and how we can prevent degenerative disease. All right. So we need to ask if we have a system, what's causing it and address the cause and not putting a bandaid on, because if we don't address the cause, it's going to evolve and it's just going to simply get worse. You're really hitting on a lot of stuff that really affects a lot of people, millions of people, quite honestly. And, um, you know, I've never heard it explained that way before, but it's it's interesting because, number one, it makes sense. And number two, it ties back to what you were just saying earlier about why animals <laughs> in the wild are so healthy and why we aren't. And when you start mixing up those those different things, in, uh, and that's a lot of that stuff that you're bringing up is mainstay diets for Americans. And so that really, you can really see how that can spiral and, and start a whole host of different problems, you know, when it first comes into your body, just not bringing in the right stuff at the right time, and then sort of setting off a chain reaction from there. Yeah, it would be better if we had that instinct. So we all would be in perfect health, but we have a freedom to choose our response. So it's time that we, you know, start to choose that health freedom and make the right choices. And and our doctor's not going to offer those choices. You know, right. we, need to, we need to find the uh, health-minded doctor. We need to find the Dr. Fat Mancini's of this world. We need to go to our functional medicine doctors and we need to get those health coaches to guide us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, or we can do it ourselves. It's just a little bit of common sense. Look at those animals in the right. Do the opposite of what drugs intend to do and you're probably healthy. <laughs> right. And then also do yourself a favor and purchase this book and some of the other books that you've got, which um, uh, they're all, all those links are going to be down below. And uh, I'm also going to put the um, uh, the QR code on there. Um, I didn't ask you this before the call, but I know you've got an app that you're working on where you're going to start a newsletter and, you know, people can sign up for that newsletter off that app and start getting these types of tips and information to really help you know, get the body into uh, top top performance or, you know, optimal health. Yeah, the app is almost done. It's being uh, in the approval process by the app store. So it should be there next week. Uh, right now we have a QR code to put in just your email. So when the app's ready, you will get a notification. 
and that app will be called biohacking unlimited there's going to be a lot of information short videos anything that you need uh to try to regain control of your health correct yeah that's awesome um now you say that we have um two different immune systems um so what are they how, how do they work together yeah, uh, that's good, John. Actually, we have three, but the third one's not important. The third one is our passive immune system, which basically is a temporary immune system that we borrow from somebody else. For example, uh, the uh, milk or the breast milk from a mother uh, contains uh, certain immunities uh, against the diseases that the mother may be exposed to to protect the uh, the unborn baby, right? So that's mm -hmm. what we call passive immunity, but that really doesn't apply to the rest of our life. So there's two immune systems and they work in synergy. And when they do work in synergy, um, they basically make us 100% bulletproof against any pathogen and uh, nothing would be able to uh, to make us sick if that happens. So what are those two immune systems? We got what we call our innate immune system, which is our natural immune system, which also is called in science the cell-mediated immune system. And so that's an immune system that's a, a, a non-specific a mechanism or a non-specific immune system. It's our general immune system. So, for example, when a pathogen and any pathogen, virus, bacteria, it's called an antigen. When an antigen enters our body, we have general things in place to basically neutralize and kill that or excrete that pathogen. Um, for example, our skin, right, with the 20 billion soldiers, our respiratory system with the cilia and the mucus to try to neutralize this and capture it, uh, our white blood cells, you know, our tonsils, our mucus, all that stuff is in place uh, as a non-specific mechanism to uh, uh, neutralize those invaders. Mm -hmm. Now, it takes our body about seven to 10 days to do that. Okay, and during those seven to 10 days, Sean, we feel sick. We may have chills, we may have fever, we may have a poor appetite, we may have rashes, we may be coughing. And again, we consider that being sick, but it's really not, Sean. It's just our immune system, you know, doing what it needs to do, which is killing the invader, okay? So we should not uh, really uh, do something to put that fever down because we're going to kind of help the invader and counteract our own immune system. What we mm -hmm. should do is rest and listen to the warning signs of our body because... For example, if we have a poor appetite, our body is telling us don't eat because we don't want to waste energy on digestion because we needed to kill, you know, the enemy. Yeah. And so when the doctor says, oh, you should eat to keep up strength, that's that's bullshit. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. listen to the warning signs of your body. So mm -hmm. that's our innate immune system. Now, let's um, what, once that happens, seven to ten days, the pathogen is killed and our health is restored, our second immune system kicks in. And that's our, what we called humoral uh, immune system, also called adaptive immune system, or we could say it's our antibody producing immune system. Because once that antigen is neutralized, our body is now going to say, okay, we're going to identify a protein specific to that pathogen or antigen. And we're going to build an antibody against that antigen so we can recognize it next time it comes into our body. So now we have an antibody. And that's what our second immune system, our adaptive humor, humoral is, uh, immune system does. It's going to make an antibody. So the next time that same antigen tries to enter our body, we basically bypass the cell-mediated immune system and we're going to just neutralize and kill that same antigen without going through the seven to 10 days of quote-unquote being sick. Because our, uh, our uh, secondary immune system now recognizes for the rest of our life that antigen and can take care of it, okay? So when those two immune systems work together in synergy, we're always going to be bulletproof. Yes, we're going to be sick uh, seven days to 10 days when a new antigen enters our body. But from that moment down, we will be immune against it for the rest of our life, right? So that's how those two immune systems work perfectly together, Sean. That is uh, that is really amazing information. And um, it, I, I mean, every time I ask a question and get the answer back, it's like, 
data overload because uh, it's really amazing what the body's doing. And it's really amazing at how many levels it's working at. And um, uh, just to touch on the, the thing with the fever. Now, when the when the body is is getting a fever, is it actually raising the temperature of your body to kill that specific thing? I mean, that's basically what's happening. It's saying, "Hey, I'm at 102 because I know at 102 this virus or whatever it is is not going to live, so I need to maintain this fever or this you know extended temperature to kill off what is actually in the system right now." Is that accurate? That's correct. It's producing energy. Wow. Yeah, that is. So we let that. We need to let that happen. <laughs> yes, and so um, uh, not to get specific, but to just generally address um, uh, a very, a very widely known fever or flu that's sort of been around for the last two or three years. I did hear that um, once that has gone through your system, because of the secondary part of your body going in and recognizing that, um, you're 26 times more powerful your body is to, to repel it or minimize it in the future because it has seen it come in. It has developed sort of its own natural uh, fighting system for dealing with that very specific type of um, cell or whatever it might be that's coming in. So um, so to, to your point, um, you know, once the body has, has taken that on and once the body has sort of conquered it, then it does have that secondary immune system now that says, okay, you're back. And we're ready for you and it's basically minimizing or repelling it from really reoccurring at any type of level as it might have on the first round through is that sort of accurate well that's 100 percent correct and that's why you know people need to understand this very simple uh concept is that you know once we you know fought that new infection and it's over our body now tags it makes antibodies against it and the next time we don't even get sick it just destroys it right and so this is a perfect time to talk a little bit about vaccines and viruses because like you said you mentioned COVID and those types of things and so so this is the theory uh, behind vaccines the theory is that we can bypass our cell mediated uh, immune system and basically stimulate the antibody uh, you know the antibody uh, system right. and so the first of all that's not normal that's not natural because our body needs to clear the infection so that it can remember it for the rest of our lives mm -hmm. okay so when we look at a vaccine there's a few things that are happening first of all we will get all of toxins in our body because those vaccines are, you know, have mercury, aluminum, and those types of things. The reason they're in there is because they will, you know, get us those antibodies because they want to bypass the system. So we're basically getting the antibodies to a certain virus or antigen or disease, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with that is, is that those, that immunity doesn't last lifelong. That's why, Sean, we need booster after booster after booster. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because we bypass our cell-mediated system. We never fought that infection. Our body cannot remember it. And so the body cannot do anything about it. We need to keep injecting these antibodies. And if we take a lapse, even though we were vaccinated, we still can get sick, mm -hmm. right? Because it happens all the time. Look around us. People are vaccinated, still get COVID because our body cannot do anything about it. Okay, we need another booster, we need another, another booster. So vaccines are never lifelong, we need boosters. Okay, so it's much better to fight the infection. Uh, look at chickenpox, you know, I, our age, we remember yeah. when our neighbor kids had chickenpox, our mom yeah. wanted us to go play with it because let's get the chickenpox, let's get it over with. That's right. We didn't get a vaccine and we're yeah. immune to it for life because our body remembers it, all right? Yeah. And that's how it should be. So these vaccines, they bypass that system and therefore we need boosters and therefore it doesn't last as long. And therefore, if we don't get the booster at one point, you know, we fall prey to the same exact virus, pathogen or antigen, right? So, so the problem here is that we now are becoming a nation of people uh, of autoimmune diseases, degenerative diseases and cancer. So let's look at the definition of an autoimmune disease, right? Because they're rampant now. They are rampant. An autoimmune disease basically is where our own, our antibodies are attacking our own body, right? 
Mm -hmm. That's what that, that's what it is. So think about this. You know, even our babies now, they get so much more vaccines than ever before. We get boosters, we get vaccine upon vaccine. And so what we're doing is we're injecting, we're, we're stimulating antibodies, antibodies, antibodies. And now those antibodies are attacking our own body. That's the definition of an autoimmune disease. So in my opinion, these vaccines greatly contribute or are the cause even of many of those autoimmune diseases. Now we talk about viruses um, and everybody can look this up. I'm not making this up, right? But when the whole, the whole virology theory or hypothesis, you could call it too, is based on the scientists were studying a diseased plant. And they found out it wasn't the fungi, it wasn't the fungi, it wasn't the bacteria. They couldn't find why the plant was diseased. So they didn't want to come up with what they always do, unknown cause. So they said, it's a virus. They come up with the name, it's a virus. Now remember, Sean, at that time, there were, not no, there were no electron microscopes in the 1930s yet. And so they only had a light microscope. Now a light microscope, you cannot see uh, something that's as small as what they called a virus, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they assumed it was a virus. Now, if you keep reading on the story, they eventually did find out why the plant was diseased. It was a nutrient deficiency. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, the term virus was coined and launched, okay? And if you look at the whole premise of virology, you would see that, you know, once the electron microscope was invented, they... Um, they were trying to look for this virus. The problem was is the intensity of the energy of an electron microscope would blast something like a virus in thousands of pieces. Mm -hmm. So when a scientist looks at a virus, it only sees a fragment of a protein of that virus. Uh, and everybody can do it right now. You can Google virus and you can try to click on images and try to find an image of a virus and you will never see one because all those images that pop up is artwork. It's artwork because there does not exist an image of a virus. Uh, and there's not one person on this planet that's ever has seen a virus, even under a microscope, right? So we're starting with the assumption that this little fragment, uh, let's puzzle it together and we call it the virus. That's the first assumption upon an assumption. And then we assume that this, you know, this thing that's been puzzled together, that this is the cause of a disease. That's the next assumption, okay? And so this virology is based on assumption upon assumption upon assumption. The next step that happened, Sean, is that now we have to, now we have to, make this whole virology theory fit a political social environment or a social political environment. Because when we look at things as mutations, okay, now suddenly viruses mutate, you know, because, you know, look at the flu, you know, you give people a flu shot, the next year we give the flu shot, but if the people get the flu, ah, it's not because the flu shot doesn't work, it's, it's a mutation, it's a different one. So we come up with these theories, which nobody can explain, which never have been proven of mutation of viruses. That's number one. Then we come up with incubation period because kids in the classroom are sick and certain kids are not sick. So the ones that are not sick, they must have gotten it from before. So now we gotta come up with a theory called incubation period, which means is the virus enters the body and decides to sit there and wait before causing havoc. Because normally our cell mediated immune system would immediately cause a fever mm -hmm. and go to work to kill it. But no, the virus comes in, takes a break. The immune system says, are oh, you taking a break? We're gonna wait to fire. <laughs> for some viruses, the incubation period is seven days, 10 days, for others, it's 90 days. We just make it up to fit a socio-political environment. Okay, mm -hmm. but there's no scientist that can answer these questions or explain this on a scientific level. Okay, so that's virology. Okay, when we go back to COVID, we know, and you can look this up too, the CDC still has been unable to isolate coronavirus from influenza A or B. Now, if you don't know anything about science or viruses, but you have a little bit of common sense, you can ask questions like this. If we cannot separate coronavirus or COVID-19 from influenza A or B, which is the flu, right? 
influenza. If we cannot do that, how can we measure the number of cases of COVID? How can we come up with a Delta variant and say so many people are infected with Delta if we can't even separate it from the regular flu? How can we come up with those numbers? The answer is simple, Sean, to fit a socio-political agenda. Mm -hmm. So that's the viruses and the vaccines for you. <laughs> wow, amazing stuff. Very, very good stuff. Um, and um, so that kind of, that goes to my next question, kind of, we already went into that, but what is your take on the, on the vaccines, the viruses and those types of things? Now, well, um, again, yes, we, we have a system called immune system, Sean, that's supposed to, you know, protect us from all of this. Animals in the wild, they don't get those diseases. They don't get a cough. They don't get bronchitis. They don't get pneumonia. They don't get heart disease because there's, their system is functioning optimally, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure that our immune system functions optimally. And in order to do that, we got to address those, at least those six major components to do that. And we don't need vaccines, you know? Um, again, it's much better to, to, even if you get the coronavirus, to let your body deal with it, mm -hmm. you know, to overcome it in seven to 10 days. And then you don't have to worry for the rest of your life about right. it anymore, right? And that's just the way to deal with it. The reason some people don't survive it is because their immune system was compromised and therefore mm -hmm. their immune system couldn't take care of the problem. So to, to be proactive and preventative amongst other viruses that will enter our society, whether they're man-made or not, and whether they're bioweapons or not, we need to make sure that our immune system uh, functions optimally and that's mm -hmm. what the book is about it's like you know uh, take care of your own health take your health in, in uh, take control of your own health and learn about how this works and how you can optimize your immune system so you don't have to worry about those viruses and bacteria and that's what this is all about great information great information now one of your strategies um you modulate and optim or to populate uh excuse me to modulate and optimize the immune system is to um, hack our killer cells. So, um, how, how do we how do we accomplish that? How do we go about? Um, doing yeah. That? So, our killer cells are they call them also natural killer cells are basically a, a form of small white blood cells that uh, originate from the bone marrow, uh, certain uh, nodes, lymph nodes, uh, and different organs in the body produce those. And they obviously go around through our lymph system and in the body to take care of pathogens and things that need to be neutralized and excreted. So we need to have a healthy amount of them in our body, right? Not an excess amount. We need a healthy amount of in, 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 in our body. And so there's many things that we can do to make sure that happens. Uh, exercise, uh, massage, uh, stem cell therapy, uh, thymus peptides. Uh, NAD plus, we talked about NAD plus last time, which is essential, uh, essential because it's the fuel for our DNA repair system, but it also is a key in a optimal mitochondrial function of our cells. So NAD plus yet again is important in uh, modulating those natural killer cells. Uh, and then there's many natural things in mother nature, right? Uh, curcumin, uh, zinc, selenium, uh, astaxanthin, astragalus. Uh, adaptogens like Elotrococcus centicosis, which is your Siberian ginseng, ginseng uh, andrographis. So there's a whole list of things that we could supplement. Uh, but many times people say supplement, supplements, we can talk about this later too. But, you know, a lot of those components are also in our foods, right? So you can identify the foods that are rich in those types of things that would stimulate or modulate uh, those natural killer cells in our body, Sean. Great information. And um, so, you know, I, you know, I, I deal with a lot of stuff in the health and wellness, and I am seeing a massive uh, number of people that I'm talking to that are dealing with lymphedema. And um, how do we keep our lymph system healthy? Lymph system is usually never talked about. Doctors don't talk about it. And it's again, it's one of those systems that needs to be really, really healthy because we learned today already, it carries our white blood cells. It's a plumbing system and a plumbing system needs to move. We need to make sure it doesn't clog up. Mm -hmm. You know, and we talk lymphedema, it's a clogging up, right? Um, so 
<clears throat> our lymph system has many functions, but number one, it's part of our immune system. It carries our white blood cells to where they need to kill the pathogen. And number two, it's also what we call a liquid waste basket. It's basically our trash can that's available all to our body where our body dumps in the waste and then the waste is scattered away and excreted or it's purified, it's cleaned up, right? So that's what our lymph system really is. So when it clogs up, that means the waste accumulates and we get a lot of toxicity. And uh, when it clogs up, it cannot bring the white blood cells to where it needs to be to clear up infections. So again, think about a plumbing system, it needs to move. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that we can do to optimize uh, that immune system. Again, here we are, movements. We cannot sit still. If we sit still, it doesn't move. This mm -hmm. is a mechanical system. It's not right. like our circulatory system where we have a pump, our heart. Lymph system doesn't have that. Lymph system depends on gravity, depends on movement, depends on compression. It's all mechanical. So we need to move. We can't sit still. That's number one. Another good thing that we can do is vibration. Uh, vibration uh, and rebounding. So we can, for example, have a mini trampoline and do 10 minutes per day of rebounding. Or Sean, you know, those vibration plates people stand yes. on, yes. they usually sold for weight loss. I wouldn't think that would help much for weight loss, but it helps with your immune system because you are moving your lymphatic system. So vibration and rebounding would be very good to do on a daily basis. Massage, of course, especially if you have somebody who knows how to move the lymph lymphatic system. So lymphatic ma massage, um, you know, of course, uh, women after a uh, mastectomy, etc., the doctor sends them to a special massage therapist or physical therapist that is educated and specialized in moving that lymph fluid again through the lymphatic system. Um, <clears throat> what else? Um, we talked about Tai Chi, Qigong, meditation, those types of things will again help move uh, the lymphatic system or the lymphatic flow. Diaphragmatic breathing, most of us are chest breathers. What we really need to do is we need to learn, and you can just simply YouTube this and learn it in a few minutes, Sean, but we need to use diaphragmatic breathing because our diaphragm, if we breathe properly, will push down on our organs and help empty our organs from those toxins and keep moving the organs. So diaphragmatic breathing will stimulate, you know, our organs and our lymphatic system in our body. Another thing, thoracic flexibility. So our thoracic spine, our rib cage needs to be flexible, needs to be moved to, again, to help move the diaphragm, empty the organs, move things around, bring healthy stuff, oxygen, nutrients to the organs, but also remove the waste from our organs and our lymphatic system. So maybe if you're very stiff, you need a chiropractor or you need a physical therapist to increase that flexibility and or show you exercises to keep that thoracic spine in a flexible position. Uh, besides those things, um, sweating, perspiration is important um, to get those waste products out that the lymphatic system is carrying. So infrared sauna, those types of things. Um, loose clothing, Sean. Guys shouldn't wear tidy whities anymore, right? We should have boxer shorts. But I'm thinking especially women with the bras, the sports bras, tight-fitting clothing really, you know, constricts the lymph flow, you know. And we, the women especially, have lymph nodes in their breasts. We all have lymph nodes in our armpits, and we cannot cut them off and constrict them with our clothes, mm -hmm. okay? So that's something we got to think about. And then hydration, we got a plumbing system. We got to pour water in it so things move without hydration. You know, those things won't move through that system. Mm -hmm. So those are all things that we can do, simple things to stimulate that system. And besides that, we have herbs and plants and compounds that can help detox that lymphatic system, such as ginger root, uh, fennel, red root, burdock root, uh, kelp, senna. I'm just thinking about a few golden seal those are all um, compounds, uh, health food compounds that have shown by research to have a detox effect on our lymph system. Mm -hmm. So many strategies to optimize that lymphatic system and lymphatic flow, Sean. That's excellent information. Um, to go back to what you were saying um, about uh, specifically about women and the bras, um, I know that I've talked to other people and um, obviously there's a lot of issues right now with with breast cancer being a pretty large uh, subject as well. 
Is there anything with that? Because um, some of them, I guess, have wires, um, metal in them. Is there anything about that specifically that, because it that might tie back to what we were talking about on our first interview with um, EMF and any of that, or just something about that contact in those lymph node areas with, with metal? Is that is it just in general, or would that add a whole nother level of... Um, possible issues well it all depends how the metal can can protect and isolate from the uh entrance of electromagnetic radiation or it can absorb it right so there's many different theories there but i would i would refer back to toxemia it's not just one thing that causes cancer yeah. it's usually one thing that overflows the bucket and so what we need to do is we need to do everything that we can to reduce the ingestion and exposure uh to toxins and increase the intake of nutrients to fight free radicals and systemic inflammation. If we can keep the toxemia in check with mm -hmm. all means possible, uh, then we don't have to worry about cancer, Sean. That's good to know. So um, let's talk about gut health because uh, you brought that up earlier. What, what are some of the ways that we can increase and uh, enhance our gut health? Yeah, and again, uh, most you know, it's it's a known fact that the gut that's where the gut activates our immune response, and so uh, it's responsible for sixty some people say even up to eighty percent of our immune system. So the gut obviously is very important. It's our microbiome. It's where our healthy bacteria live and digest and do whatever we need, mm -hmm. and so we need those healthy bacteria to counteract uh, those bad bacteria and to reestablish. Uh, health in the gut after an invader has been there destroying it, right? Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is obviously it's the importance of probiotics and probiotics we can take as a supplement, but, you know, fermented foods are loaded with probiotics. So we need to make fermented foods part of our uh, daily diet. Now, uh, this is another topic, but I'm not a fan of dairy products and milk products. So I'm not a, a, a fan of fermented dairy so I would stick with the other fermented foods, you know. Uh, I'll drink my kombucha tea on a daily basis. Uh, kimchi would be, kimchi and sauerkraut would be something that you can incorporate uh, in your diet. Uh, we can look at seaweeds like uh, spirulina, corella, and kelp and those types of things. Uh, the dill pickle, uh, obviously. So if we, you know, make sure that our fridge has some of those uh, fermented foods in it, and we eat those on a daily basis, then we provide our gut with some healthy probiotics. And we can obviously take, in addition to that, uh, a good uh, uh, supplement of probiotics. The other thing, Sean, is we need some fibers. A lot of people uh, don't get enough fibers because we're not eating our vegetables and our fruits. And those are the things in Mother Nature that provide us with fiber, you know. So we need psyllium husk. We need, uh, we could eat oat bran. But most of all, you know, uh, citrus fruits and apples because they contain pectin and they uh, contain those types of things that make things move in our bowels, in our intestines and keep our gut healthy. I will also say that uh, the most important mineral that our gut needs is magnesium because magnesium relaxes the gut, relaxes the intestine and promotes the movement uh, of uh, our intestines called peristalsis. So we need magnesium. The best form of magnesium is magnesium trionate um, is the one that I would suggest. So magnesium is important. And of course you can find magnesium in whole foods too. It doesn't all have to be supplements. We can know we can find magnesium in certain uh, green vegetables in our Brazil nuts. And in many nuts, we got magnesium sources. And then we have many things that we can take to detox our gut. And we go back to ginger, uh, fennel would be good, rhubarb would be good, senna, uh, kelp, golden seal again, and many other um, components that have shown research-wise to be helpful in detoxing our gut. Great information. So we're talking about gut uh, and we're talking about uh, things for the gut. Do you want to just um, expand on that? We can talk more about just our... Um, um, like our optimal diet in addition to the, the gut? Is there any additional information just in diet in general that we can expand on from there? Yeah, I think, you know, like when I had to go back to basics, we really have to, <clears throat> and, and those, those things are in my first book, Sean, Health for Life, uh, because that's where I go try to share the basics uh, with, with the reader, yes. 
And some of those basics are, again, you know, breakfast is the least important meal of the day. We only should eat one healthy meal of the day. It talks about rest, sleep, sunshine, listening to the warning signs of the body, et cetera. But to give a little bit of information today, again, common sense, we need to replace man-made foods that are void of essential nutrients with wholesome, healthy fruits and vegetables, right? It's just common sense. Uh, we need to replace our uh, coffees and our uh, monsters and Red Bulls and fruit juices and sodas with pure alkaline water. Uh, simple things. Uh, we need to learn about alkaline foods and anti-inflammatory foods. We need to learn about food combining. We mentioned that earlier as an example of the acid reflux. We need to know we shouldn't combine proteins with carbs. We need to know, for example, that foods are healthy, but we shouldn't eat them as a dessert. Because if we eat them as a dessert, our body's going to take, what, several hours to digest our meal and our foods are sitting there rotting, fermenting, and we don't get any benefits from our foods. We just get toxins from our fruits. So fruits need to be eaten by themselves in between meals so they can rapidly digest and we can benefit from all the minerals and nutrients and vitamins that are contained in those foods. So very simple things, very simple basics that we need to uh, learn on how to eat and what to eat. Uh, good things uh, that uh, we can talk about is also juicing. You know, I love to juice because with juicing, we can get the essential nutrients from so many fruits and vegetables that we were, would be unable to eat in a week, right? I mean, we can eat you know, a whole bag of kale and 20 carrots and six beets and, and eat six lemons in one meal, but we can juice them and get all the benefits from that. So juicing is something to look into to really increase the intake of all those nutrients. Another thing is fasting. You know, fasting just as sleeping is a process where our body resets, it repairs, it regenerates, it renews. And so last time, I think we gave the example of a supermarket or a Publix where during the night, you know, people are restocking the shelves. If we don't do that for two or three days, nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. Customers will be upset and, and the business will have to close. It's the same with our body. If we don't allow time to repair and regenerate and get ready for the next day, we're going to degenerate and we're going to be diseased and we're going to get cancer. And it's the same thing here with fasting. Um, I mean, it's hard to fast for a week. It's hard even for me to fast two, three days. So I'm one of what, what we call intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. my, uh, my meal, my dinner is in the early evening, five, six o'clock. And I skip breakfast, which is the least important meal in the day. We can talk about that another time. And so eat again at 11, 12. So now I have a window of six, seven hours that I consume food. And I have a window of about 16 to 18 hours where I don't eat. So at, during that time, my body can repair, regenerate, renew. It can get rid of stored fat. It can get rid of exudates. It can, it can you know, do things that are important. It's getting rid, rid of a tumor. It can keep finding pathogens that invade it versus putting out fires of systemic inflammation and dealing with digestion. So fasting, juicing, back to basics. Those are the simple things that we need to put in place to give our body what it needs, Sean. You, um, you did bring that up on our first call about um, how much energy your body takes to um, do digestion. And uh, one of the tips that you also had uh, said was uh, to, to, which I think you just brought up again, but to give yourself three to four hours before you go to bed, before you eat and do not eat before you go right to bed, because your body's taking all that energy and, and, and processing all that food and it's detracting from you actually getting real good sleep. Yeah, the food going into your mouth till it uh, till it be broken down in the digestive system, getting to your small intestine, to your cells, based on what food it was, it's going to be from two to meet four, six hours to shellfish eight hours, right? So, so what we're looking at now is, yes, we need to eat four to six hours before we go to bed because we don't want to go sleep and the digestive system working and working. We won't be able to get into a deep sleep, number one. And so we won't be able to repair and renew because the body still is dealing with digestive issues. And it really uh, detracts from your level. Is it NADH? Uh, yes, NAD+, NAD plus and NADPH, you know, NAD so your NAD+, plus is the fuel of your repair system, and that's mm -hmm. what happens at night, is we repair systems, we repair DNA, 
And so it takes the fuel away from that system. So even if we wanted to repair, the system wouldn't have any fuel because we use that fuel for other purposes, unnecessary digestion. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm hearing about the, the original stuff we talked about, about the, the, the peptides and the, the different types of um, material that the body needs to break down the food, which was what you really started talking about also, about how you've got one type that's breaking down proteins, another type that's breaking down carbohydrates. Now you can really understand how long that digestive process can be when you're eating, because that's our standard diet is everything is not just, you know, let's make it easy for the body. Let's do proteins now. Yeah. Let's do fruits in the afternoon. We're just, you know, just stockpiling everything and just shoving it down there and just saying, you know, here you go. And the poor body. So yes, it takes longer, but at the same time, the body's confused. It takes longer. And that's why we get indigestion, heartburn, acid reflux, stomach ulcers, etc. The body always tries to compensate. John is going to do... It's going to make sure you're not dying today, but the compensation has to end somewhere and the compensation mechanisms get worse and worse and worse. So uh, what about supplements? Now, do we need supplements? How do they figure into all this? And, and what are your recommendations there? Yes, I get the question a lot. And, and, and at this point in time, I always have to say, yes, we do need high quality supplements as an insurance policy. Even if, Sean, we exclusively would eat organic, wholesome foods on a daily basis, I think we still need high-quality supplements. And here are the top three reasons. Number one, we don't get our wholesome organic foods from our own garden anymore. If that's the case, you're one of the lucky ones. And maybe you have a hydroponic system, and that's what we all should be looking into in those types of systems. Mm -hmm. Because if we get our organic foods from the local farmer's market or the health food store or the organic section in the supermarket, people need to realize there's a time that lapses between harvesting and consumption. And during that time, a lot of essential nutrients are lost. <clears throat> for example, if we store asparagus just for one week, 90% of the vitamin C is gone. Wow. If we pick an apple from a branch, 30 minutes later, 50% of the enzymes are gone already, right? <clears throat> so I'm not saying not to buy whole, wholesome organic foods. Yes, you do we want to avoid all the toxins in man-made foods and we still will benefit from these live plants and vegetables but we also need to realize there's a lapse that causes us to lose a lot of the nutrients unless you get them straight from your own hydroponics aquaponics system or your organic yard that would be great we pick it we eat it we juice it you know that's the ideal situation but in most of our cases that's not happening so we got to realize we lose a lot of the nutrients even if we are eating the healthiest possible number two our soils as you know are depleted from the essential nutrients and minerals that we needed after world war ii farmers started to use npk fertilizers that's only three minerals our body needs 70 to 90 minerals to uh, function optimally. So again, even if we eat all those fruits and vegetables, a lot of nutrients that our body needs are missing. And number three, Sean, <clears throat> as we spoke about last time, we don't live in pristine areas. We live in cities, we live in towns. We have polluted air, polluted water, exhaust fumes from the vehicles that are passing by. We have chlorine fumes from our shower. And now we got all this electromagnetic radiation from the advances in technology. And so there's an onslaught of toxins on our body. So <clears throat> just eating uh, these healthy foods is not enough anymore to counteract that onslaught. And so I think high quality supplements are kind of an insurance policy that will help us giving our body everything it needs to repair and replenish ourselves and keep toxemia in check. So what supplements are important to modulate and sort of optimize our immune system? What, what would you recommend there? Yeah, I, I guess all of us kind of learned some of those during the COVID area, right? Because there's this vaccine, no vaccine. Why don't you, you know, boost your immune system? So even the average person that never was kind of involved in, in, in health, you know, learned about vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and those types of things, right? So yes, those are important. Vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, echinacea, uh, selenium, those types of things are proven to modulate and optimize the immune system. Of course, we need our antioxidants also. Uh, glutathione is still our most, or one of the most potent antioxidants uh, in our body. Um, we produce it, so we really can't take it. There are supplements, you can do IVs, 
<clears throat> we don't know what the half-life is and if they're actually effective. I can't speak out for that either. But what we can do is we can take the precursors to glutathione. Uh, so we promote our body to make it itself, which is what it's supposed to do. So we're talking about um, alpha-lipoic acid, milk thistle, and N NAC or N-acetylcysteine. So those are three precursors to glutathione, which would be important to supplement with. So we know our body can make that important antioxidant. We got curcumin that's important for the immune system, uh, nitric oxide. Uh, again, nitric oxide is not something that uh, we can just supplement with, but we can give our body the two essential amino acids that are necessary to produce nitric oxide. And that's uh, L-arginine and L-citrulline. So we can dose two amino acids to make that happen. Uh, we got echinacea, we got elderberry, we got a whole list of things that we need to make sure we incorporate in our diet to keep our immune system uh, functionally optimally. Yeah. Great stuff. Now, I know we've talked and touched on a few things, but um, do you have any other uh, tips that you would like to share <coughs> that would um, also help keep our immune system in a very high state? Yeah, like in summary, Sean, we, we talked about the six components. So we need to optimize the lymph system, our gut, uh, our white blood cells, you know, uh, those types of things we talked about. There's uh, things that we can change in our diet that would help us just like animals do. We can put certain supplements in place to make sure that we have those nutrients to make that happen. And besides that, you, you basically touched it on in the beginning. We need to upgrade our diet. Mm -hmm. But we really need enough sleep, John. We need that rest. We need that deep sleep. And people that cannot sleep good, they need to start, you know, learning how to meditate. They need to start learning how to control with their mind and calm their body down and be in the present. They need to learn they can't eat snacks before they go to bed because that's why they can't sleep. Their body is still working. It's doing stuff. It's digesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to put that mind to sleep. We got to get, we gotta get into a deep delta sleep so our body can repair our system. So sleep becomes important. We need enough rest and sleep. Um, we need to listen to the warning signs of our body, right? So many times we're, we're relaxing at night. We're sitting in front of the TV. We're watching a movie we already watched three times. <laughs> our body, we try, we're falling asleep. So what is our body telling us? Go to sleep. Yeah. But we still want to watch, you know, that last part of that movie, even though we already know the ending. So we need to really start to tune in with our body a little bit more and listen to what it's trying to say. Uh, so sleep and rest are uh, very important. Uh, we touched a little bit about sunlight. You know, we usually work indoors. Uh, we come home, we still spend time indoors. We need to spend a lot more time outdoors if we can, like you said, walk on barefoot in your yard, you know, watch the dog poop, but otherwise walk barefoot, earth, do some earthing, do some grounding, you know, take that t-shirt off. Don't worry about your neighbors, uh, you know, walk in shorts, get those jeans off, get that sunlight, go do activities outside, play with the dogs, take your walks, go to the beach, go to nature walks. You have to spend more time outside so you can get the benefits from the sunlight you know mm -hmm. we talked about animals today look at look at the animals that live around the equator more sunlight Th those are the beautiful animals with lots of colors those are the big tigers you know the the big beautiful animals of the world live around the equator those that are no those that are living in the dark rainy areas are the animals that don't have colors the animals that are blind, the animals that are deformed. It's the same with people. If we don't expose ourselves to sunlight, we degenerate. We cannot flourish. We cannot be vital. We don't have any energy, right? Mm -hmm. So let's get that rest and sleep. Let's spend more time outside. Take those clothes off. Don't get arrested now sleeping, uh, you know, walking naked on a walkway, but take those clothes off, you know, take those shoes off, get enough rest, get enough sunlight. And the last thing I can say, Sean, and it's probably another... Um, you know, uh, interview here, but emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Negative emotions, stress, they really affect our body. They add to toxemia. So we really need to learn. And I'm meeting one of your friends tomorrow. That's going to help me pushing further into the direction of manifesting, mm -hmm. you know, our mind taking control of our body, mm -hmm. trying to find peace, 
trying to avoid negative emotions such as worry and fear and jealousy and frustration because they're really dragging us down. And so that would be the third other tip besides rest and sleep and sunshine is we really need to start taking control of our emotions and uh, finding ways to do that meditation, mindfulness. Find yourself a mentor, start doing those types of things. You will be a much happier person doing that. Fantastic. There's a couple things I just want to touch on um, with that last uh, bit of information. The first is, well, I'm going to start with the second, actually, instead of the first. I'll go back to the first because well, now that we're talking about emotions, um, some of the research that I've been doing lately touches on the work of uh, Misara Emoto, um, and it goes to how your emotions and your thoughts can actually um they can actually change the molecular structure of water. And you can actually, with your thoughts, change the molecular structure of water. And with positive, upbeat thoughts, you can actually change water into a snowflake pattern. And with negative fear emotions, which you're just saying, can actually turn that water molecule into a blob. And that's documented science. And that's not just the water you're drinking, that's also the water in your body. So those emotions are doing so many different things, but they can actually change the molecular structure of the water in the cell and also change the water that you're drinking. And then that gets into touching on other subjects with intention, but being, but being mindful of the fact that your emotions are playing such a big role, not just internally, but externally is something that I think that, you know, like you said, maybe down the road is probably its own, its own, uh, its own topic of discussion. And then uh, when we were talking about sleep, um, this ties back into your first book or the last book, um, uh, the EMR, The Hidden Threat. Um, there's, there's a couple of things we're talking about earthing, but I know you also do carry a product, which is a um, earthing grounding uh, bed cover. And uh, from, from kind of the work that I've done and some of the studying that I've done, that bed cover um, is doing a lot of different things. Now, first off, it does it mitigate the uh, the EMF. It does basically pull that EMR, that radiation out of your body. Um, how, how much of a factor do you think that is in people's sleep carrying EMR in their body and being exposed to EMR while they're sleeping? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, it's good that you bring that up because we talked about how important sleep is to regenerate and, re you know, restock, restock the aisles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we can function optimally. So um, this, this bed cover, the anti-aging bed you're talking about, you can buy the bed that I bought the cover like three years ago. <clears throat> what it is, <clears throat> it has multiple functions. Number one, it has the nano silver threading and the nano silver threading shields ourselves from all the electromagnetic radiation that adds to toxemia and really is harmful to the body. It's coming from our cell phones, our wireless devices, the Bluetooth, the appliances, <coughs> anything that surrounds us in our house, even in our, even in our uh, bedroom, right? Because we <coughs> gotta drink more water, Sean. You're good. You're Hydrate good. my lymphatic system. Yeah, you know what? I'm really feeling guilty right now because you're drinking water telling me what I should do and I'm sitting over drinking an espresso and I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> you're still I trying to wake up. Maybe you didn't sleep well, right? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I think but, I'm more of a creature of habit. I felt like I did, but I'm just programmed. I'm like a mindless robot. I'm just in Well, that and you, you touched upon that. We are all wired. As we grow up, you know, we do the same thing over and over again and our neurons, they wire themselves and now we automatically respond to the stimuli because people always say like, I drove to work, I passed all those intersections and I don't remember it was green or red. Our body is wired and gets us to work and we figure out how did we get here, right? Mm -hmm. That's how strong we're wired. But what we need to do is we need to do that mindfulness meditation. We need to be aware of what's happening and we can go beyond that subconscious to rewire ourselves, right? right? To get a different response because this is setting our future and <clears throat> our habits, you know, if doing the same thing is not going to change the, res the, the result and that's what we're all wired to do. We basically can predict our future because nothing's going to happen unless we break that down and you're talking about your coffee and those types of things. Mm -hmm. So we need to make a conscious effort 
to break that habit and rewire that brain for sure. Uh, but back to our bed cover <clears throat> is, um, you know, it protects us from that EMF. At the same time, we plug it in, we, in, in our electrical socket, it's a grounding. And that grounding from the earth now feeds negative ions uh, into our body, which neutralizes those free radicals that we have accumulated during the day. Mm -hmm. And it has also an infrared, which helps the microcirculation. So this bed cover does many uh, positive things to get us into a deeper sleep and actually promote the repairing mechanisms that should take place at night, John. So yes, I've been sleeping on it for three years. Uh, people says, oh, that stuff doesn't work. Well, <laughs> we can measure it. You know, yeah. we have EMF meters that you can buy and you can measure the radiation on your body. And as soon as you lay on the cover, it goes to zero, Sean. So, you know, there's no argument that those things work. And so we can take advantage of those tools uh, to kind of help us with all those things. Yeah, I know that uh, there'll be a link down here at the bottom in the description. So for anybody that wants to get more into that or look at that, there'll be a link down there where they can look at that and order those. And I do also have those. And um, I, I have found that I sleep much better when I'm when I'm on those, um, on the bed cover. And I think I shared the story with you um, on the last video. I'll just tell again real quick that, you know, I, because I'm on that, and this kind of ties into the other subject a little bit with the EMR, um, you know, I, even if I'm not grounding, getting out, outside a lot, I'm still at least on that bed cover for eight hours. So I'm sort of cycling in, getting that, that you know, that benefit. Um, but I went three or four days when I saw your presentation down in uh, Orlando at that conference. Um, it had been about three days. I usually have just a small, uh, like a pillow cover type one that I can bring with me when I'm traveling. And I forgot to bring it. And down there, they said, well, here, just take one out of the warehouse. And, you know, I was scrambled, running all directions and I didn't do it. I thought, oh God, I forgot it again. Right. So um, to go back to your point about meters and testing, we, you know, we do test a lot of that equipment that's down there. And um, one of the other things that we do is we test ourselves <laughs> And I hadn't, I hadn't been on, I hadn't been grounded for, at that time, it'd been almost four days. And when I hit that meter, my reading was OL, which stood for over the limit. And that was four days of basically not being grounded. And my body had absorbed that much uh, electromagnetic radiation that the meter couldn't actually even read it. Um, and so, you know, that's actually shocking. And the, the title of your book is EMR, The Hidden Threat, and that's exactly right. It's hidden because if if I didn't get that meter reading, I, I personally, my body doesn't have the ability to, to say, here's your reading. You almost need those the meters to do that, but but the amount of uh, radiation that our bodies are carrying um, is, is really, uh, it's off the charts. And um, how much of that do you think affects people's sleep that are that are out there that don't know what they're um, carrying and th that are being exposed to high levels of this? How much of that EMR do you think? Well, really Sean, it's it's exponentially increasing, and we, you can't get away from it. Of course, mm -hmm. the book talks about how we can shield ourselves and and the, the steps and the strategies that we can implement to drastically minimize it, and we can, but we need to first be aware of it because, like you said, it's mm -hmm. hidden. Uh, it's invisible. We can't smell it. We can't taste it. We can't see it. We can't feel it. So we think it doesn't exist. But obviously, there's 30,000 studies uh, on PubMed that show clearly the negative side effects of this non-ionizing radiation, which was thought to be non-harmful for many decades until today. And mm -hmm. so we can't really get away from it because walking into a building, there's Wi-Fi, there's Bluetooth. You know, we got the towers, the G5 towers. Uh, we get all that. Even, even if we don't carry a cell phone, we still are in the crossfire of power lines and, uh, you know, wireless devices and those types of things. So um, it really adds to the toxemia. It adds to free radicals. And so the body is trying to put out fires. And when the body is working, we can't get into a deep rest, John. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important that we mitigate those effects. The uh, EMR book, you know, gives you hundreds of things that you simply can implement at no cost to do that. Uh, it was a best-selling book on Amazon. And uh, it gives you, you know, as you know, Sean, all my books, the last chapter is basically a check off to-do list for everybody to go to at their own pace. Uh, so they always have action plans. It's something that's not just explaining things, but also giving you the things that you can implement 
uh, to be successful in doing that. So um, yes, we need to be aware that it's there. Uh, and like you said, you can measure it. And then we need to implement whatever we can uh, to mitigate those harmful effects. And uh, you're 100% right. You know, the onslaught of that radiation is keeping us awake and preventing us from getting into a deep sleep. Right. And um, uh, a couple things also. So that's, you know, the, the, the anti-aging bed cover uh, product. Um, number one is pulling that EMR out of your body so you're not absorbing it. You touched on the... Um, uh, the benefits with the uh, far infrared because it does have that far infrared technology and we did touch on earlier the fact that when you're touching the earth you are absorbing those electrons which is mitigating or basically neutralizing the free radicals um, one thing also that I found um, which I found also very interesting is that the earth resonating at the Schumann resonance uh, 7.83 hertz is actually the same frequency that your brain waves run on so uh, you know, all these different things that that bed cover is doing to really enhance and get better quality sleep um, is probably one of the best uh, technologies that I've run across. Um, that's a very simple thing. Put it on your bed and go to sleep and let, let that thing just kind of do its thing. But that's a, you know, that's a technology that's out there that, you know, you've used it for three years. I've used it now for about three or four months. But now that I've gotten used to that, um, I, I really, I have, I know when I'm, I, like I say, when I'm out of town and I'm not using it, I can definitely tell the difference. Yeah. No, Sean, you touched upon something awesome too, again, like any man-made currents now are AC, you know, our body is DC current, okay? Mm -hmm. And everything in Mother Nature is DC current also. So we resonate with those frequencies, absorb those, and we are one with those. But um you know, uh, we changed our DC currents to alternating currents, and those are harmful to our body, and everything around us is AC. So, yeah, frequency is another topic, mm -hmm. um, but there's healthy frequencies and healing frequencies, and then there's frequencies that are harmful to the body. And so we need to mitigate and block the unhealthy toxic frequencies and surround ourselves uh, or absorb the health frequencies or healing frequencies that are out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just kind of finish off with this and I'm going to give you a chance to finish off. But, you know, one thing I really like about your work and, and your career is that you got into a lot of um, medical related um, fields, obviously did a ton of research and then said, I need to back up because I'm looking for more of a long term, uh, more of a long term fix for my patients. Um and so you you backed up and sort of went back to basics, and um, and now we're really at a point where we're talking about you know basic things that we can do for the body, but not not for necessarily short term, but really for long term benefit. And I love the fact that you revert back to the animals because they've obviously got it figured out. I mean the animals. Like you said, with no, you know, they don't need any complicated uh, agendas to really figure out what it takes to maintain good health. And I really, I really like the fact that you looked at a lot of these other things and said, well, what is it that they're doing that we're not? Because obviously, they're they're living a much healthier lifestyle than we are. So, um, you know, as we keep doing these interviews and I keep learning more, I really appreciate the fact that you know, you kind of went in in one direction and you and act, have fantastic knowledge and database of information from that, but then said, this is not going to be enough and I'm going to have to pull back and I'm going to have to, you know, try to get into some other sources of information to really, really dial this in even a little bit tighter. And so um, I, I really like the fact that you revert back and we go into just things that uh, talk about exactly what the body is, how it works on a very natural level. And it's um, it's not it's not inducing um, it's not inducing a lot of the things we're being told to do, and it's really certainly not inducing or taking um, a lot of the the prescriptions that we're being fed. But it's actually looking at how our body works, how it actually um, functions, and what it actually needs from a very healthy, holistic point of view. So I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate your work and what you're doing to, to, to get that out there. And uh, my goal, as I told you before the call, is to, you know, make this a regular ongoing series because the amount of information that you're giving us is really, number one, it's super important, but there's a lot of information that we're getting that none of us have ever been exposed to. And 
this is the kind of video that if you've watched this video, you probably want to watch it at least twice, maybe three times, because there's a lot of information that, that Dr. Mike is giving out um, that that's stuff that we need to reprogram into our brain to kind of piece by piece, change the diet, change how we're eating, know when the right times to eat are, know what the, the, the you know, the structure of how we want to eat things. So, um, you know, I want to say thank you so much for all that information and thank you so much for making yourself available and coming on the channel to share that with us. And, uh, and with that being said, um, is there anything you'd like to finish up and say before we go? Well, Sean, uh, plenty of information on this episode. So I think there's uh, enough information we gave to people to absorb, but I want to thank you. Uh, people like you are a host because this is a platform that we can get our information out and help more people. And that's what it's all about, John. So thank you for your time also. Thank you so much. So for anybody out there, um, we're starting a playlist. So for anybody that's seen this video for the first time, Dr. Mike's first interview that we did with the um, EMR, the hidden threat, uh, that's also out there. I'm going to link that down below. Um, uh, Biohacking Unlimited, Dr. Michael's uh, website, we're going to have that on there. I do want to bring up once again that I am going to have that QR code here coming up. Uh, so once we get done with this segment here, we, we got to, uh, turn off. Um, get that QR code, sign up for the newsletter. Um, he's going to have a newsletter out there that's going to give you really good information and, um, and the website and all that will be on there and also links for uh, ordering the books and seeing some of the information that Dr. Mike has put out there. So Dr. Mike, once again, I'll have all that down there. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, have yourself a great weekend, and I'm going to look forward to seeing you again here soon. Thanks, Sean. Talk soon. All right. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye.